All right, I want to thank Chief Pigskin for the opportunity to present today. Um, I've been following Chief Pigskin for a long time and have learned a tremendous amount of football. I think they've covered some of the some of the best high school programs that we've studied in the Midwest, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Uh, my topic today is preparing and executing short yardage offense, so I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I'll, offer cover, I'll also cover how uh, short yardage offense is integrated within our overall program and our overall program philosophy and I'm excited to get going. Uh, my name is Brad Birchfield. I'm the head football coach at Bishop Hartley High School in Columbus, Ohio. I've been the head football coach. I'm entering my 17th year. Was five years at uh, Centerburg High School, which is in the center of the state of Ohio, and I've been now my 12th year at Bishop Hartley High School. We have a great tradition at Bishop Hartley. I'm excited to be a part of it. My email, as you can see, and my cell phone as well, um, at Hartley Football is the best way to connect with me on social media. We do the best job we can to promote our own program and promote our kids. Uh, we love football. Our staff, my offensive coordinator, Chris Sawyer, who I'll talk about quite a bit, uh, loves football. Myself, uh, we're excited to connect with anybody that wants to connect and certainly any kind of information that we might have, we're happy to give to you and uh, share with you at any point in time. So without further ado, let's go. I think we need to start off by talking about what our philosophy of football is and um, developing a philosophy of football I think is something that uh, we need to sit down and think about. Reading Pete Carroll's book, Win Forever, many years ago, he talked about uh, leaving the, uh, the Jets or the NFL and going into um, taking a couple years off and he read uh, many books, and one of them being Wooden's book, and talked about what your philosophy is, and his philosophy was all about the ball. And I, we looked back and said, what's our philosophy? What do we believe in? What do we, you know, there's many key words that are important. Culture and climate and philosophy and uh, all these kind of things are important to any kind of program, but we had to sit down and decide what was important to us and what we wanted our kids' philosophy of football to be. And we came down with three things. We came down with teamwork, toughness, and tradition. You know, we think those three can encompass everything that is in our program, everything that we want the kids to be about. We think those three things solve every problem. Uh, obviously, teamwork is self-explanatory. The kids working together for a common goal, but it's just not working together on the field. It's working together to develop whatever your individual role is for the team to be most successful. It is working together um, to make your role integral to the team. Football is the greatest sport in the world because a kid can stink in ninth grade and be little or be chubby and then as he gets older he gets a lot better or you know we need the starting tailback to run really fast. We don't need the tackle to run really fast. They have different skills and different ideas but working together and identifying those ideas. We've had great football players who thought they were tailbacks but became great guards for us and helped us be really really good. Toughness is something we take a great deal of time defining. Um, toughness goes into short yardage offense, you know, the identity that we're going to convert and the situations that we're going to be put in. Uh, toughness is something different than a fight. You know, it's not a fight. We don't really believe that football is fighting. We think that football is, um, is straining and grit and resiliency and getting knocked down and, and jumping back up and not being good and getting better. Those are all uh, definitions of toughness, much more than putting the fist up or talking trash or these things that sometimes are identified by young people as toughness. And tradition, as we said, uh, are, are, is a foundation upon our team. Now, there's a lot of things we talk about with tradition at Bishop Hartley High School, one of which might be that, uh, gosh, we've only had three coaches since 1962 at Bishop Hartley and really proud of that. We have four state championships, which are played in state championship games six times. All those things are, are tremendous. Multiple, nine regional championships, multiple uh, all-state players. Those are great, great, great uh, measurements of tradition. But I think the best measurement of tradition is how hard the kids play today to not let down the people that came before them. And that's how we define tradition. That's what we want our kids to accept uh, when thinking about tradition. So teamwork, toughness, tradition, that doesn't have to be your philosophy of football, but I think you need to have a philosophy of football and you need to put it up in front of your team. You also need to have a mission statement for us. Like we took keywords 
that we wanted our kids to be a part of. We wanted them to be devoted to one another, dependable, men of character, men of toughness, leadership, uh, faithful service, we're a Catholic school. And we put all these words kind of on a board many, many years ago and we came up with a mission statement. Now that mission statement is whatever you want it to be, but here's where it has helped us quite a bit. It's helped us to identify kids when they're disappointed because they didn't get to carry the ball enough or they didn't have uh, whatever the defined role on the team they thought should have been. It's also helped us with parents because parents sometimes will say, you know, Brad, what does my son need to do to carry the ball more? And, and I'll say, listen, he might be better suited to do that, but the mission of our program isn't to get your kid to carry the ball more. And I think when you have a mission statement that the kids can reflect upon and parents can reflect upon, it gives you a great opportunity to set a foundation for your program. Um, high expectations. We, you know, we, we played our state championship games, our most recent state championship games in Ohio Stadium. There's a huge poster of this that hangs over with the words believe on it. I think what separates uh, teams that are really good compared to teams that think they're good is that genuine belief of what they can accomplish. So I think the more visuals you put around your weight room, around your locker room, the more visual stimulus that you give to the kids, I think the better off you have a chance to be. So the words believe are all around and they're important. And then we believe in growth mindset. We believe in those of you who are familiar with growth mindset, you know it's the idea that there's strength within me, that there is, uh, that failure is the best opportunity for me to become successful. We don't really believe in tests. We believe in that uh, if you get a question wrong, that means you just don't know that answer yet. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that uh, you're never gonna know it. In fact, it doesn't mean that. If you can't block somebody, you know, that's not a good enough answer. I can't block them this way. I can't, we need to find another solution. So growth mindset is something that you'll hear many times around our program. We want the kids to kind of take that journey to be successful and that journey to be as good as they can be. And uh, you know, you'll see that all around our program. You also see historical resiliency. Uh, our kids have come back over and over and over again. We've you know, won nine regional championships and it's been a one score game and I think almost all these games. So we want to put these signs around our locker room and around our kids so that they know they're never out of a fight or they're never out of a game. So when these start talking about historical resiliency, I heard that term many years ago. I don't know, they were talking on a, on a, on a game and I could tell that, that, that whatever, when they had heard historical resiliency, it had been said in their meetings the day before during a college game. And I thought, wow, that's us. You know, our kids understand that they, uh, they've come back before, so they have that in their DNA to come back. So again, more messages and stimulus that you can put in front of the kids, whatever it is you believe, I think are, are tremendous. Championship culture, what we think a championship culture is. You see the word culture everywhere. You like you have to say it or you're not a real head coach anymore. And um, we certainly want to identify what a championship culture is. And I think that culture is who you are and uh, combined with what you do and combined with why you do it. I know you could people make a lot of money talking about just those three things, but we kind of want to identify it like this. Like the kids have to like each other for us to be successful. The kids have to genuinely like each other. The kids have to like each other and they have to like the coaches and that that's where sometimes we get a little hairy is that uh, you know I, I sometimes hear from coaches where they'll say you know it's my way or I don't care if they like me they got to respect me I think that may work in somebody's program but I think that there has to be a partnership of working together and I think the kids have to like the coaches I think that's important and going back to, uh, to growth mindset um, the kids have to have an identity to solve problems. You know, I, I, we've never been a staff that's gone into a game saying, we're gonna do this. You know, we're gonna staff, we're gonna run power on these guys. Now, many times we've, we've said, listen, we've gotta find a way to run power, but it may not be this way or that way, and you gotta be able to adjust on the fly. Um, you know, I've got a defensive background as well, and you know, I don't know that we're gonna be able to take away their best plays, so we need to be ready to go to to plan B quickly. I don't know that what we worked on in practice, we're, we're gonna be able to, to execute better than what they're executing. So we've gotta be able to find a way to solve problems. And it's not acceptable just to kind of say, oh shucks, they're better, they're better than us at doing this and that. Uh, we gotta be able to find a way to solve problems. So that's how we identify a championship culture for us. Our players need to value the role they have rather than the roles that uh, they desire. I mean, I think that I'm not one of those guys that believes that, uh, 
you know, gosh, it's, it, parents are so much worse today than they were back then, and kids are so much worse. I really don't believe that, but I do know, having my own children, that I like my children more than I like anybody else, and I like everybody. And I understand that the, our parents love their child more than anyone else. They want their child to have the best role on the team, whatever they define as the best role on the team. So we have to do a good job, as Coach Krzyzewski is saying here, of the players valuing the role that they have. It might be a 10th grader who's not as good as he will be when he's a senior. Value that role because one day you're going to get better. The first day when the freshmen come in the weight room, I have them tell me, that I say, are you ready? Here's, what, here's where we are right now. And they're all ready. Well, how are we? We're weak. And they all have to say, we're weak, you know, back. And we're weak compared to how we're going to be. And they get a big kick out of that. Here's what the next uh, half hour is going to be here uh, presenting. We're going to talk about preparing and executing a short yards offense. We're going to talk about what considerations we make offensively going into the week, which I think is important, how we prepare. Game planning short yardage and then practice organization. I think you got to have a plan for short yardage. It's 2019 and we're going to constantly evolve those plans. Listen, when we've won and lost games, the big ones, I mean against the really good football teams, it's because we've been able to execute the money downs, third and fourth downs. When we've lost them, the really good team, against really good teams, we haven't been able to execute. So let's talk about some of these things. I think here are the offensive considerations that we're looking at. What our players can do, what our players believe, and what your community believes. And uh, I, I don't, we're a down blocking team that really wants to run power. And we'll talk about our splits being really, really tight and why we do that. Um, and I think that in my opinion, right, in my experience, I think running, there, there's nothing uh, that can combat low men with shoulders down low and legs churning. I think that's the, I think that's as indefensible as you can be on offense. I think that the spread guys are great, but if they're running mesh, I think people can drop off and zone off in that thing and cut those meshes off. I think if you're running hitches, people can jam those hitches, and I don't know answers to some of those things. Our community believes that running off tackle, and our community believes that great offensive line play is going to be successful. Now, how do you get your community to believe that? We've played great football teams that spread it out. And their communities, I can see, believe that that's the way to win games. And those, team, those teams win state championships. They win great games. Um, I can't take anything away from them. Their community certainly believes that. Our community believes in hard off-tackle play. Our kids, our junior high kids, believe that playing on the offensive line is a great sense of honor for them when they come here. And that's important. Our players believe in it. Our players believe in it, and it has to be reinforced over and over and over. You have to glorify the offensive lineman. We all know that, right? Our best football coach coaches the offensive line. And, uh, you know, they have, t they have dinners over at one another's house, and it took a couple of years. The kids were, the offensive linemen were talking about going over to dinner with the offensive line coach and offensive coordinator. And I, I was very, I was a little bit disappointed I wasn't invited. I, I didn't know about it for a couple of years. thought I was losing touch of the program. And uh, you know, dawned on me, those guys have to be unified within themselves even more so than, uh, than other, other areas of the team. So the kids take great pride in that. That helped develop that great pride. Um, so that, that's what we want to be able to do. That doesn't mean you're always going to have great tackles, great tight ends, great fullbacks. But you have to have a consideration of what your players can do and balance that with what you guys believe in. I think I touched on the second one, what we can teach. You know, we feel like we can... We feel like those transferable skills on the offensive line, a, a great down block, can be taught and can be corrected and can be perfected. And we at least have studied that so that we feel pretty good about, about the way to coach that. Um, we skip pull, if you're familiar, which is a clinic in itself. I know when we first started talking about skip pulling, we had to really go out and learn it because I, we I was a down the line pull guy. And uh, skip pull's better. You know, we had to learn it. We had to become experts at it. We had to learn to be able to teach it. We had to learn to, uh, to be able to correct it. And so we had to be master of that. I, I don't know, and I, I guess I'll touch on it here in a little bit, that uh, when people will come and say, we want to do what you do on offense, I think you have to learn to be able to correct it year after year after year. I don't know that if you're putting in a new offense, it's going to take a little bit of time to get really, really good at it. And not because it takes time for your players to get good at it. Of course it does but it takes time for you to be able to learn how to correct it. Um, we've been a big jet sweep team, and it's still an integral part of our, of our offense, what we want to do. And in 2006, 
It was one of those muddy nights where all the fields in Ohio were destroyed. Uh, week 10, and we couldn't get, we couldn't really run jet. You know, we couldn't plant, we couldn't cut, we couldn't, and it, and it dawned on us, we couldn't correct it, right? I mean, we couldn't correct it, and we lost the football game and couldn't do well enough, and uh, so that's kind of when we decided to, we could correct a little bit more off tackle play. There was no corrections for the sloppy field and the slipperiness and the perimeter runs when the weather raises such a havoc as it does in the Midwest. Um, in Ohio, we have all four seasons and often in the same day. So you don't know if it's going to be raining, wind, um, yeah, all that. So you, I think the off tackle game has helped that. We beat spread teams who have, who have been beaten by Mother Nature much more than they were beaten by Bishop Hartley. So um, that's at least put an impact on it. But principles are never going to change what we do. Our principles are never going to change. We could change year to year. I think running the quarterback power is a great football play and we have really good quarterbacks and it's been a great thing for us running power read is a great way to run power right but our principles are never going to change the offensive tackle playing a three technique isn't going to know if we're running power read or if we're running under center eye power right it's the same football play to him so the principles are never changing but football is evolving quite a bit and uh I think it's important that whatever your principles are, going back to our opening philosophy, that those things never ever change. Um, and our principle is going to be this, our, our, the best runner is going to get the ball behind the best blockers and if possible attacking the weakest defenders. And I think that sounds simplistic, but how are you going to do that? In our situation, what we're going to do is we're going to run as many formations as we possibly can at people. We're going to run as many motions as we can at people. We're going to run as many shifts as it takes. We're going to trade as much as we can. We're going to do the best that we can to get our best blockers in areas where their best defenders are not, right? We want to get our, and then uh, it's easy to give your ball to, the ball to your best player. We all have ways to do that. But how are we going to get our blockers against their people that aren't as good as us? Um, and then the considerations that you give. Putting formation in the boundary. I think that's always a, that's always a, a quick one and an easy one because you're identifying where they're putting their best defenders. Are they going to put them into the formation? Are they going to be uh, steadfast of putting their, their best defenders to the field? And then you can use formation if they're going to put their best defenders to the formation, which is now into the boundary. You now have more area of the field. And the area of the field is, um, I know many coaches believe this, that it, it's such a weapon that you can't, clinic with college or pro or, or watch pro football or anything like that because the field is so wide in high school you got to be able to take advantage so um, we want to find that uh, weakest defenders if, if we're playing somebody who's really really good we'd rather run at them than run away from them because they're probably really long and and can chase things down but we want to be able to attack their weakest defenders in most cases um, our short yardage offense the way we prepare for short yardage and our identity and our uh, practice organization is we want to create a goal line and short yardage mentality. We have a drill that we do run every Tuesday at the end of practice. We call it six from six and we'll put the ball on the six yard line and it's best on best um, and there are six plays to score and once they score it starts all over again if it's in a defensive oriented drill. So it's six plays and you want to try to identify the best things you can do in the short yardage, uh, short yardage game. Um, we get what we emphasize. So if we're going to emphasize the critical moments, if we're going to emphasize the, the most important plays of the football game, then we've got to practice it. And it becomes difficult in our situation to practice one offense versus a scout defense because, of course, of course that scout defense believes that they're meant to be in there to get scored upon. They're meant in there to be dummies, right? That's where the, the term comes from. Um, the six from six drill every Tuesday at the end of the day, at the end of practice, has helped us build a mentality, a short yardage mentality. It's been a way to practice it. You still have to practice against your scout team to put in your short yardage plays, but you gotta have a gotta find a way and you don't have much live reps nowadays anyway. So how are you gonna put those live reps into practice? For us it's the six from six drill on uh, on every Tuesday. Uh, short yardage situations in scrimmage. So we set up our first scrimmage this way. In Ohio, you can have three scrimmages. And our first scrimmage 
is more like an extended practice, but it's a lot of reps. A year ago, we got 180 reps. That's the very first scrimmage. And we will have a situational portion of the scrimmage. So the first part of the scrimmage, when we scrimmage our opponent, we put the ball in the 20, and you have 25 minutes, first and 10 from the 20 going in. It just starts over every time you score, every time the turnover on downs. So it gets you into a four down mentality and you're playing against good people and it's good on both sides of the ball, obviously. So that's how we start our scrimmage. Um, the next section of the scrimmage is all third downs. So we'll have uh, third, and tw third and long three plays, third and medium three plays, then third and short three plays. The sticks are up, so you've got to convert. And I think that's been great for us because that sent a message. We're probably not very good in short yardage early in the season. And that's able to send us a message to the kids and to the players saying this is an area where we need to get better. It's a point of emphasis. It is uh, you know, often it's a point of consternation the next day when we come in and watch tape because we weren't good enough in the critical moments in short yardage. So we want to make sure as many scrimmage situations as we can, we can get those in, them in those third yardage and money situations. Uh, we want to use big backs, right? We want to use big backs. We want to use the smaller, quicker guys to run jet and rocket, which in the wing T philosophy is a toss play. But we want to use our bigger backs to kind of wear on a defense as much as we can. Um, we've had many backs with, with incredible numbers, but man, they, they weren't great uh, college prospects because their 40 time probably wasn't up to snuff. But they were incredible high school football players. And they were incredible because they wore on a defense in the second half. So we would sacrifice speed in the backfield to be able to wear on people by the second half. So we believe in big backs. And I already talked about this. We wanted pride in the offensive line. Uh, the best coaching on the staff happens on the offensive line. Our best football coaches coach the offensive line. Um, our most respected football coaches coach the offensive line. Our offensive line coach is somebody that the, that, uh, the kids believe can solve the problems that are on the offensive line, and that's important. Still kind of playing. He's also in the box, too, because he's an offensive coordinator. So that, that's not always ideal on the field. We've got it, but we've had to plan to make our most corrections at halftime, right? Our most intense corrections. You've got to survive that first half making corrections. Second half, we've had to make the sit-down corrections. I know other staffs can do it a little different. That's what's, this is what's worked for us. And then we talked about promoting unity within the group. Um, my first job, first head coaching job, the, uh, the, we had an assistant coach who was an older veteran coach who, uh, who talked about, uh, wanted to give the offensive line an identity and they had these black shirts and they were the hogs and all this. And I thought it was stupid, right? Because I'm trying to promote a team identity because I'm the head football coach. And I was young and stupid because it was really good. It was really awesome. I, I, the, Bob Lattister is the winningest coach in the history of high school football. He won a million games and lost like zero at uh, De La Salle in, in, or in San Francisco. And he said this, they were an option team, so different than an off-tackle team like we are. But he said it takes until about week four to get really good at running the option. I think that's us. Like it takes till mid-season for us to figure out what we're good at doing and what we're not good at doing. So we're, uh, being a traditional, we've had years we've been traditional wing T team. Buck sweep is a really good play for us. And man, we just, some years we just couldn't get it going. And we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna uh, bang our head against the wall, but we were probably gonna be a little more so of trying to maybe be more of a power team, or more of a, uh, more of a belly team, or more of a trap team, um, or more of a jet and rocket team. So it takes till about mid-season to see that. We've never had an undefeated season, uh, but we've won lots of state championships. We've, we've had problems, we've had teams that put whoopings on us in the season, regular season, and then we put whoopings on them in the playoffs. So uh, it adds a kind of an identity to get better. And I think that this quote, uh, mid-season getting good, gives the kids confidence that we're going to correct the problems. You know, there's no throwing down helmets week one when we, when we get whooped. It's, it's okay, let's go back to work, let's figure out the problems that we're going to have. What do we consider when developing a game plan or, or creating a game plan? Um, the first thing we take, so we meet every Sunday night as a staff, and uh, Friday night we'll play the game, uh, then everybody will kind of be on their own, and then they'll meet Sunday nights after watching the game. And it's the first thing that goes into our discussion on our, on our offensive side is, who's the defender we're gonna have the most problems blocking, right? Who's their best guy, and how are we gonna attack him? And there's been a couple ways that that we found many, some successful, and we've had to learn from those that were not successful. We feel like the longer 
um, athletic kid. We feel like the athletic kid, right? The, the kid who's, who's a really good football player and they love him when he's in shorts, right? When colleges come in and they ask, they say, man, uh, Billy's really, really good. Have you ever seen this guy? He's, you ought to see him vertical jump. And when I hear things like that, I know we've got to run at him. We've got to run at him because he's probably a guy that can chase it down and harder guy to cut off. So we want to try to, try to game plan that. Um, uh, we, we usually want to run away from the bigger guy. We want to run away from the guy because we want to wear him out early. I think that's kind of a consideration. So when you look at the best football players, and, uh, you know, I believe that high school football is very different from college and NFL, obviously. It's almost like different sports. And the best college teams, the defensive line is all incredible. The best pro teams, obviously, the lines are, I mean, they, they can stop running games with, with three defensive linemen against five offensive linemen. It's, it, it, it's something else. In high school football, we think that oftentimes um, there's somebody who's really, really, really good in there, and we've got to figure out, maybe they're putting, are they putting them at three technique? Are they putting them at five technique? Um, if it's a defensive end, usually they don't have a pair of those cats, but they'll have one of them and who's a lot longer than the other. And so we want to decide how we're going to attack him. If we've got a really good five technique or three technique, we go through this. We want to try to throw as much at him early on as we can. We want to arc him at some point. We want to double team him at some point. We want to trap him or kick him out, and we want to influence him. We want to use all that for him, and we probably want to do that early in the football game. We think so highly that that player can be disruptive of the football game that we want to uh, we want to give him as many different looks as possible, right? We want to block him as low as we can legally, as low as we can legally. We want him to have as many uh, questions on where we're coming from as he possibly can have. I think the more they're thinking, it makes sense. The more they're thinking, the less they're reacting, the rest are getting up field. My high school coach was a legend. And, you know, we, we've talked a lot of football with him and wanted, and he said, you know what stops whatever play we're offense? Well, I, well, coach, what? He said, people going as fast as they can upfield. And we think that's true. And uh, not a ton of people run trap anymore, but uh, that used to be a way to dissuade them. But now people are so good. I, I don't know. That's uh, such a great thing. We want to know how they're going to line up, where they're going to put their best people, and how they're going to line up. So we believe in multiple formations, and we believe in showing them multiple formations early. If you have lots of tight ends, I think using lots of tight ends um, or using multiple receivers, how are you going to do it? I think in 2019, people are people love it when you get in two receivers on each side and one back in the backfield. I think that's how they start their, their camp days or their summer days or their installation days on defense. People don't like four guys on one side of the line of scrimmage with their hands down. People don't like a lot of wings. People don't like a lot of backs. People don't like a lot of tight ends. Um, it just has become a, a difficult thing to practice against. So we want to use that. How physical is the team versus how fast they are. If a team is typically physical, obviously we want to get on the perimeter. And if they're really fast, we want to, uh, we want to run off tackle. And if they're physical and fast, we want to get them off schedule. So no, not really. We, we want to keep, uh, we'll, we'll have to find some answers. Um, are they going to defend the formation of the field? And we said that. And we also want to identify the last thing is how good are they on the perimeter? What's the guy on the perimeter that we want to put in the most conflict? Who can we block on the perimeter? Um, who can we put in conflict or run past conflict or, um, or a leverage conflict like they've got to have contain? Are we kicking them out? Are we trying to get outside of them? I think the most important thing, you know, they, they uh, everybody in, in, in the world has heard about Spygate and they were spying on plays and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know that's the most important thing. If I could go and watch, uh, watch a team practice or watch an opponent, the best piece of information wouldn't be what plays they were gonna run. The best piece of information I could possibly get is how they teach their overhang, their perimeter defenders, their dual responsibility defenders, how they teach those guys. That's the most important piece of information you can get because somebody on defense they're asking her to do this, except when they do that. And if you can find that person, I mean, I think that's what we're trying to do. Our offensive package for short yardage usually looks like this. If we can run wedge, we want to run wedge, right? We want to get everybody as close and as tight as we possibly can. And we want to run them. We, we want to get our feet running and make it look like a car accident. If we can run three back power, I think that looks a little bit like wedge, except we're kicking out and we're wrapping now with the third back. Um, we love quarterback keep off power, or at least the threat of quarterback keep off power to get defenders running east and west while we're still running north-south. 
Buck sweep is a great play on the goal line. It's a great play in short yardage. It is the offense. It's the running guys, um, running guys version of the bubble screen because you're getting a lot of blockers out in space and you're getting uh, a back there and still a counter action in the backfield. Rocket is the quick toss, the the quick pitch that you used to have in the old school wing tee, and now uh, I think the the Georgia Southerns and the Navies and those teams start running it from a motion. You know, we thought we could do it from motion without motion as much as we can. And then power pass puts everybody in conflict. So everybody knows what I mean, power pass, running it to a tight end side or somebody thereabouts that's running a deep flag, fullback faking power and running flat and try to put that flat guy in conflict. So those, that's, we want to, I think it'd be a great world if we could run one of those five things in the goal line. Um, now, how do we practice short yardage situations? Because that's what becomes tougher. Uh, becomes tougher to simulate practice uh, because of the physical play. We're not a believer in shields. I don't think the shields move. I'm a believer of, of blocking people. Now, um, you can't go full speed and do that all the time. Not because of regulations and those things are important and need to be respected. But honestly, it's not the smart thing to do. You know, the idea is to get the kids healthy for Friday. How do you get the kids healthy for Friday still practicing physical situations? Here's how we do. We have what we call blocking stations every Tuesday. So everybody has their traditional tackling stations where we'll do our angle tackle or our frontal tackle or our um, close tackle, whatever your tackling stations are. Well, we want to do the same thing. We want to do the same thing, but only we want to do it on offense. So we would have blocking stations. So in four groups, everyone would uh, get in groups by position, and we want to set these up, uh, and we want to start practice like this. So every player is going to learn how to reach, and every player every Tuesday is going to reach block. Quarterbacks are off the side. Quarterbacks are the only ones not involved in this, obviously. Um, but everybody's going to learn how to reach block. So a tackle reaching, we're going to teach it in a transferable skill, meaning a skill that can be taken by multiple different positions. Uh, a receiver is going to learn to reach the same way. And that receiver is going to block that way when we're running jet or we're running rocket and they're blocking a force defender out there. A down block, obviously a shoulder block. Uh, every position on the field is going to learn that. Pull and kick and then blocking in space, which is more of our jet and rocket drill, which I'll get to here in a second. Um, but everybody's going to rotate about two and a half minutes through, and you could set up whatever your skills are, but I think you want to identify these transferable skills. For us, every skill revolves around thumbs together, head back, and elbows in tight. We want to try to impact people with that kind of spear that way. So that's a transferable skill for us. Every position on the field, maybe the exception of quarterback, we'll see, he might lead up there on power as well. Uh, needs to learn how to do that. Early in the season, the first day of pads, uh, we want to do a goal line and short yardage drill. And what we usually do is like this. We do it a couple different ways. The first one is the offensive line is on the ball. And we put, I put down the 25 defenders. I don't know if we have that many, but we have about 15 kids kind of sitting in A and B gap. And our guys got to get off the football, right? We overload on the defense and our offensive guys got to get off the football. So that's one of the very first things we'll do. What we'll also do is we will put uh, the ball in the 10 and they got to score from the 10. Then we'll put the ball in the seven, they got to score from the seven and the ball in the three and they got to score from the three. And we add defenders as they're going in, into the end zone. Then we'll take it and we'll start moving it out and do the similar type of thing. So we're practicing short yardage every, every time we can from the very start. And I kind of touch on this here. The ball's on the five yard line. They've got to score every play with three plays. This is another thing we do kind of the first day of, of practice or first day on of pads. Every time they don't score, every time the offense doesn't score, they're running to the 50 and coming back. This isn't punishment, but I think it's a reminder. If the defense, if they score, the defense is running to the 50 and back. So there's a loser that has to do something every play. And I think it shows that there's a sense of urgency involved. So we'll do that for a goal line and short yardage drill. We also talked about the third down drill that we would do in scrimmages. And uh, it is better against another opponent than somebody else. So as you great coaches are out there and you're deciding who you're scrimmaging, I think it's important to scrimmage like-minded people. We have very respected coaches who've been coaching a long time. They would never do something like this. They just wouldn't, this wouldn't be something they would be into. For us, it is. We want four plays from third and long and how we're going to convert. Four plays from third and medium. Four plays from third and short. This also helps with the bullets flying a little bit 
the coaches to kind of get in their mind of what they're going to call, how they're going to call it, what they're going to look for. Um, you know, we're big seven on seven. We love seven on seven. I, I think seven on seven is fun. We don't throw it a ton, but I think it's fun. But I think part that's most transferable is in the summer when you can get teams and just do situations, right? When you get into those seven on seven tournaments and it's third down and you've got to make a stop or you've got to convert. And it helps you to kind of understand how important those are and how important those plays are. So the more situations you can put in those money downs and those things where you either convert or go home, the better off you're going to be. Every Wednesday, we're going to do jet and rocket drill as part of the blocking station. And jet and rocket drill is set up like the bubble drill, right? We're going to have an outside defender, or we're going to have a perimeter blocker, and then a receiver. So we're going to have two blockers. We have the center quarterback and then the guy running jet and it's just a half line drill against a free safety who's unblocked and two force defenders up here and they've got a block. We're also going to put them in the worst case situations. We're going to have a perimeter blocker coming off the edge and I've got to get my head in front if I'm blocking them, get my hand on hip and start running it. Um, we're going to do that during our hawk days, which are our two -a days every single day. And in season, we're going to do it every Tuesday. So we think that's important. I think jet and rocket are tremendous Listen, those are either great short yardage plays or they're terrible short yardage plays. We thought the toss was a great short yardage play, but you got to get that perimeter block or it's a disaster. It's a, it's, a, it's a lost yardage play. But if you can get a block out there, man, it's a lot of field for that guy to go run. And again, when I say rocket, I'm meaning the old school toss, the quick pitch. Jet, uh, I think it's a really successful short yardage play. I think that there is, it's so tight to the line of scrimmage, I think it becomes a little difficult with guys coming off the edge. But uh, I see guys have a lot of success with it, and we have as well. We like to practice wedge drill, right? So the first thing we'll do with the wedge drill are those big pop-up dummies. Now listen, I love Jim Trestle. I, lo I, I like Ohio State, but I love Jim Trestle more than Ohio State. Warrior had a great offensive line coach that hated Ohio State, so he called the big dummies the Trestles. And the name is fit, so the name is stuck. So we're going to do that. But it's hard to move those those big dummies. Hard to move those trestles, the big pop ups. What we want to do is we want to wedge drill against them, guards down, and they've got to drive them out, butt up, uh, shoulders down. So we will practice that. We obviously practice in the shoots and put those trestles in the shoots, and then we'll do shoulder versus shoulder. This is a great drill in the off season too. You don't want impact. Obviously, but if I could lock my shoulder up against someone else's shoulders and just run our feet, that's a tremendous drill that you can do all year long right now. And then the board wars, right? We'll have them off the boards, two yards off, and they've got to drive. It's impact, but it's close impact. And I thought that's a tremendous evaluation tool. I had a dad one time ask me why uh, his son wasn't playing. And I said, well, let's get him on the boards against the kid that is playing. And if he whoops him, we, we need to give him more reps. So I think it's a tremendous evaluation tool because it's me against him. I think the last couple points are you, you're going to get what you emphasize, right? We're constantly yelling to cover the pile. So as plays go, we want our linemen flying downfield and covering the pile. We don't want our backs running backwards. No one wants their backs running backwards. No one wants their backs hit and move backwards. But you'll find it's like we're hype coaches and the hype coach just yells all the time. He doesn't say anything significant. He just yells all the time. But we want to yell the same thing all the time. Cover the pile. Cover the pile. Cover the pile. Be physical. That's my thing. Cover the pile. Cover the pile. And at some point, what you emphasize becomes cultural. The kids understand. It ties back to what I talked about 40 minutes ago with that it's uh, the kids believing that, man, this is really cool to be an offensive lineman. And they understand to cover the pile. Um, we won the state championship in 2015, 2016. We started out two and two. And one of the tackles from the team the year before came back and he said, he, he was using colorful language to say we weren't very tough, told the offensive lineman, and he said, he said, I don't see anybody covering the pile during the games. And the kids, well, that was more offensive than calling him every dirty word in the book. You're not covering the pile. So it had become cultural and, and the kids got that. Pad level, another thing we want to yell over and over and over again is pad level, pad level, pad level. I saw a quote from somebody talking about uh, the Minnesota Vikings and the, the Zimmer team, they said they learned from Parcells that when you do your early scrimmages, all you care about is the pad level of all 22 guys. I thought that was pretty good, and I think that's something we need to see in the scrimmages. Um, I get this question a lot, and I wanted to answer this. This is kind of my last point. 
is splits and stances. Our splits are tight. They are foot to foot splits. And our stances are very low, right? It's almost like a frogger stance. And I don't know how the stance came about. I really don't, but it, it happened and then everybody wanted to do it and it was cultural and they could explode upward, I think, because they were so low. Um, but the splits, I do know where that comes from. The splits, we want to be them as tight as we can for a couple reasons. First off, we, we're not, we're, you're not going to get any run throughs, right? People aren't going to game plan to blitz us because those splits are so tight, they're just running into brick walls. Okay, so we wanted to give ourselves some uniformity and preparation of knowing, because we're a little bit unconventional the way we run the football, um, we wanted to have a little bit of uniformity on the way people could defend us. And if we thought those tight splits, at least it didn't have a bunch of crossers and gamers and no offensive line coach likes that. No, nobody does. They like to have brick walls. And the second thing was we could kind of identify how teams wanted to defend us. If they want to pack a whole bunch of people in tight for power, we were going to have a little bit more room on the perimeter, we felt like. If they wanted to spread it out, we wanted to be able to run a little bit more room on the, on, for power. So I thought those splits, tight splits, have helped. Now, teams that have thought they would do well combat us want to chase things down from the backside. So we got to be prepared. Counter misdirection have been good plays for that. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for the 40 minutes that you invested in learning about this. Uh, I'm sure I, I covered a lot of stuff. And uh, if you want to know more about it, I'd love to hear from you. Please call or email. And uh, thank Chief Pigskin for giving me this opportunity. Mm -hmm.